I'm Josh Barrow, host of Left, Right, and Center, KCRW's weekly forum for civilized debate across the political spectrum. Today's news cycle demands more time for deeper analysis. So Left, Right, and Center is now a full hour every week. Subscribe and listen at kcrw.com slash LRC. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. Neither party's agenda really aligns with who its coalition is today. It was the dumbest speech I have ever seen in my life of covering politics. When people walk into a voting booth, at the end of the day, they do say, I really should vote for someone smarter than me. I'm Warren Olney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. This is the 20th year of the show, and it's always good to have somebody I've spoken to before sitting across from me. And my guest today, the Academy Award-winning director, George Miller, I've known for almost 40 years now. I first interviewed him in 1982 for The Road Warrior, and it was one of my favorite interviews ever. I've had a chance to talk to him a couple of times since then. He is here for the newest installment of the Mad Max series, Mad Max Fury Road. First of all, George, it's so good to see you again. 1982, and the first director you, you interviewed. Nin- That's yes, amazing. Yes, eh? it's, it's, it's gone pretty well for you since then. but <laughs> Yeah, and you too. I mean... <laughs> We're still young men, I think. Well, you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we we talked about so much, and so much what we talked about was about the psychological import of film. And one of the things I asked you about then, I want to actually go back to, was your ability, which we've now seen pronounced over the years, is to treat cars as characters. Look, I I came to film basically out of curiosity. I used to paint and draw, and when I would look at film, I went back and wondered what the film language was. What is this new syntax that's basically de- developed over, you know, it's now about 120 years old, really. And it's a new language, it's universal, and we read it before we can read books. It, it, as children, it, little kids uh, can, can watch, not, not many months old, watch something on TV, and you know that they're apprehending it because they're laughing little cartoons and, and things like that. I've noticed that in my own children. So I went back to the silent era where, where, the, where the language was forged and in particular the action movie, the Buster Keaton movies, Harold Lloyd movies, the two real westerns and so on. And then with, with sound, everything kind of became much more... Uh, I guess theatrical. Yeah, in there the was actually the, there was actually the proscenium march that all the old yeah, films yeah. used to use. Yes, because the the machinery, the tools were so cumbersome, so it locked everything down. And then the the sound booths, as they got smaller and smaller, as the cameras got smaller and smaller and more manageable, then there was much more agility. So that's what that that's why when I made my first film, Mad Max, it was to be an action movie, and apart from horses and um, there's cars. <laughs> And so I always loved uh, filming that and finding the, the way to, to tell the story uh, one shot to the next. Because I guess what I remember was talking about silent films because you said you liked the almost subconscious impact of silent film. And, and it's still something that your films almost trade in kind of a dreamscape. It's been so interesting to watch your career over the years where most of the films you've done can work without dialogue. I mean, I think about Lorenzo's Oil or, or, or Happy Feet or Babe, and they're films that for long passages don't have dialogue anyway. Well, that's cinema. That's, that's cinema. You know, you, you, you always pick up from the, the masters, and, the, and one of the great things about Hitchcock, for instance, was not only the, the, the way he, he made films, but the way he was able to articulate ideas about films and he said something that was highly influential to me he said I try to make movies where they don't have to read the subtitles in Japan and that really struck me yes it's a it's a universal language and you know some movies depend on the spoken word enormously and that's that that's great and they can be very cinematic but in the case of the movies that I've been interested in it's to see how much it can get across how much feeling story um, subtext you can get across in in the succession of images just like it's visual music just like a, a composer 
uses music to all all the causal relationship between you know chord progression mel melody line tempo and all of those things that go into music and shape the whole i remember i was lucky enough to work with john williams way back in the uh in the 80s on Witches of Eastwick. And, you know, they, they look at a scene and they kind of are looking for the count, for, for, to, for the click track. And he, he, he said something, he says, it's really interesting. When I look at this movie, the, the, the beats and the tempos are very, very precise. And this, this is purely without any sound. So there's something inherent in the performance of the actors. You're looking at... Uh, for a kind of rhythm and mu music musicality in the way that the actors play uh, the scene, and then in the cutting pattern. So he, that was the first time I realised that there, there there is a tempo to, to cutting, and not just where you make the cuts, but just the overall feel, but overall some, feel of it. But for me, there's almost something orchestral in the way you work in that. You often will have a dolly shot onto an actor who's moving, and so often we see a dolly is basically to kind of make a point to move into somebody who's sitting. But for you, that dolly is to move into someone as they're moving away from the camera or towards the camera. And I wonder where that came from for you. I don't know. The one thing I, I realized I was doing unconsciously when I first started to make films is I was really trying to create as much a sense of volume, three-dimensional volume, on the 2D screen. And uh, so therefore it was uh, wide-angle lenses rather than, than uh, long lenses, which tend to flatten things. Uh, so in wide, wide le angle lenses, there's a, a depth of field. And this almost obsession to move the camera in the, in the so-called Z or Z axis in and out of the screen, because rather than, say, zooms and so on, because it's, you, you feel somehow you're moving in that space. And that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, going back to your earlier question about about filming cars. If the angle is one in which they're coming at the camera or away from camera in a very, very tight eye line, as we, as we say, uh, then that again emphasizes three-dimensional space rather than panning across the screen. And I was doing that unconsciously and so I was really trying to create a sense of immersion uh, even back then. I think that's why I, I tended to move the camera. It's a treat, man. I'm interviewing the first person who ever asked me if I was old enough to drink when I interviewed him. That's George Miller. His new film is <laughs> as director is Mad Max. Did I ask you that? We had a drink after he said, you old enough to drink? <laughs> 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 so I guess I, I, I'm wanting this too because, again, for me, it, there's almost a tradition that you kind of grew up in of the Australian car film, of the car they Paris or Stone or all these films that basically treat Australia as the West. Yes. And, and, and that was a very kind of different idea than a lot of the Australian films that people maybe knew about. As somebody who went to drive-ins and what we called B pictures back in the 20th yes. century, I got to see a lot of those movies. And, but there was a sense of immediacy in those films that you wanted to bring to your movies, wasn't there? Yes, there was. Um, Australia didn't make many movies, but for a whole host of reasons in the 70s, there emerged almost unbidden a whole group of people making films. And with a little bit of government support, uh, the, the, there was you know, filmmakers like Peter Weir and Bruce Beresford and a whole bunch of them. Everyone started making short films. And there were what we call the filmmakers cooperative, where people would help each other. Uh, we, we all learned from each other's film. If someone wanted a sound recordist, you know, we'd, we'd grab some equipment and teach ourselves to record sound, then we go and help someone on a film. And at the time, there were a, the, there were a lot of period films, and it was, there was a sense when you look at everybody's work together that somehow we were catching up in the 70s on Australian history. But then there were others like me who, who moved into genre, but for, for me, doing Mad Max, it was like a sense of, you know, we're not we're not slumming doing these these so-called B-grade drive-in movies. I mean, ag again, for that reason, those reasons I mentioned earlier, I thought it was where cinema a language was was forged. But it also came out of the the, the life that I'd experienced. You know, I grew up in remote rural Australia with big, endless roads, and the car was the 
was the way that young people somehow expressed themselves. They'd drive down... I'm sure it's an American experience as well, but they'd drive down the main street at night, up and down. It wasn't a big, a long main street. And, and you know, the, the, the sort of hot rod culture and stuff, I remember that as a kid. And then, you know, going going to movies. I just love those uh, Roger Corman movies. And, and where, where, it's where all the great... So many of the great American filmmakers started, you know. But I mean, so. the, for me, though, I mean, the, really, and this maybe one of the first questions I even ask you that the cars had personalities. You cast the cars as if you were casting people, didn't you? Well, in particular, in that movie, that Max's car. But I can't take credit for that because uh, Byron Kennedy, my late partner, he he wanted to take whatever budget we had and put it into one great <laughs> muscle car, and uh, and. And it's still there in the Mad Max movies. It was called. We called it the Interceptor. Yes, but in, in, but in Road Warrior as well. I mean, those cars had had personalities too. I mean, each car, each conveyance, was there to sort of give us a sense of who and what was driving it. Definitely. I mean, definitely. When when we when we got to Road Warrior, which is the second film, we uh, we had a bigger budget. So the, the art director and the and and the team working on the vehicles were able to sort of basically express. Characters, and even when we got to Mad Max Fury Road, you know, that became very, very serious and deliberate issue because we saw the vehicles as an extension of wardrobe, just as props and weapons were. So you had the Immortan Joe, who's the tyrant, who has the the most over-the-top vehicle, which is a somehow two Cadillacs, one on top of the other with massive wheels and whatever, and it was a mobile throne. And it was part of the pageantry of his power. And and whatever he was wearing in his wardrobe was then reflected on the interior of the vehicle and so on. So that that applied to, to virtually every, every vehicle. Yeah, because they've got to make an impact or else it's just a procession of cars. And it's one of these things that so often when they're car chase movies, I mean, you think about the way Friedkin cast that car in The French Connection or the way yeah. Spielberg cast the car in Duel. Yes. I mean, or again, going back to Peter Weir in the car they Paris, that that car. I mean, yes, yes. these cars are all you see them, and you think, "Whoa, I hope I see this thing again." And and that interceptor, if Byron certainly pushed you toward that decision, but you made the decision to use that car, and it's followed through in everything you've done. All the all these cars in these in these movies have been there as the kind of homes in a way. I mean, it's it's it, they, they they're these places where these characters, to some extent, live, aren't they? Absolutely. I mean. I, I never thought about that before, but the the, in a way, Fury Road is is quite a, an intimate film. It's a group of people in a confined space. They they are homes. They are little habitats. And I think they actually, within the resources of the wasteland, they decorate them in a way uh, that that they would homes. I mean, it's all very functional. They're weapons and they, everything in this movie is is found art repurposed, found objects repurposed. So a steering wheel is not only a steering wheel, it, 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 it's, it's decorated in, in, as we see in, this, in the film, they almost become religious artifacts. No, so, they, no so, they, 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 they def- they're, they're, everything is totemic in the movie, isn't it? Yes, very much. Even the vehicles, I mean, even, even the war boys, uh, Nux, played by Nicholas Holt, he has uh, scarified like a tattoo on his body the the a map of the engine block uh, of an engine block because they believe that that these vehicles that have survived that have survived some apocalyptic event uh, are really u- unique and as you say totemic t- t- hu- humans and particularly they who are half life half life war war boys already suffering from some sort of toxic disease uh, uh, they are fragile but these machines are forever. For me, that's why they spray their mouth in chrome, because they want to sort of say, "Well, we w- we want we want that permanence of those of those that's vehicles." Cool. Yeah. yeah, we'll take a break. My guest, who is keeping Detroit alive, is George Miller. His <laughs> newest film, his director, is Mad Max Fury Road. It's the treatment. There's more to come. Stay with us. Check out KCRW's all-news channel, News 24. 
programming from KCRW, NPR, BBC, and more 24 hours a day. Go to kcrw.com slash news24 or listen on KCRW's app. This podcast is produced by nonprofit radio station KCRW. KCRW relies on member support to help keep our programming fresh and authentic. Find out how you can donate at kcrw.com slash join. Welcome back. It's The Treatment. One of my favorite people to talk to is sitting across from me, the Academy Award winning director and Oscar nominee again, George Miller, for his news. He's worked with animals. He's worked, <laughs> he's adapted books. He's done true life stories. He's created his own mythology that led, that inspired the Saw series. <laughs> I'm, I'm <Man>. told that. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess one of the things I want to talk to you about, too, the thing that's run through all of your movies is the idea of sacrifice for the future. I mean, some character basically trying to build their life around keeping their children protected. That's the thing that's run through every single film that you've made. And, and that's really interesting because it started clearly before you were a parent. But that, that idea of keeping of children being the sacred objects, really... Uh, almost religious o- objects, in fact, because they represent the future, is really fascinating to me. I wonder where that comes from. There is a sense that we collectively, as human beings, are on some, on, are on some sort of human adventure, the meaning of which we don't really fully understand. But we struggle always to understand that. And it goes without saying that whatever we do, if 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 we... if if we can, uh, in, in the way we address the world, we, we, we need to regard the future. Uh, otherwise, we're kind of doomed. Uh, and, and we're seeing that now. I mean, things move very, very rapidly, as we all know. And there's almost an accelerated pace, driven, I guess, by technological advances and in, in every way, whether it's the medical technology that, keep so many of us alive just simple things like hygiene and water you know clean water and antibiotics things that so many of us would not be around had it not been for those and that's been only you know a lot of that's been since world war ii so yes and all these things you're talking about basically less than 100 years yeah so uh, and then the other technologies modern communications and modern travel and and it's extraordinary to think uh, that we can have devices uh, in our hands that can tell us exactly where we are. And what time world, it is. And what time it is, <laughs> and that time it is, and get instant information and send it out and so on. All of those things, we're heading into some future, and it's almost bewildering. And, and there's two responses, I think. One is to try to clamp down and be fearful of, of, of change, or try in, in a helter-skelter way to understand it as best as possible but, and but, to manage it. But those poles exist in the movies, people who are fearful of change, who want to maintain the status quo, and people who are bound for only to protect their children to look towards the future. It's in Happy Feet. It's in Wishes of Eastwick. It's in Lorenzo's Oil. It's in the Mad okay. Max films. It's part of all these movies. Well, the, the other way for me, the only way I can explain that, the other way for me is is the basic classic hero myth, the Cam- Joseph Campbell hero myth. So, and, 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 and the essence of that is the hero is the agent of change, that basically through relinquishing of self-interest, they basically somehow adjust the world and, and, and in a sense bestow a boon on, on their community. Uh, it's, it's pretty classic, and I didn't... The only, only reason I got into it, and so many people uh, got into it, in, particularly in the movie industry, is that I couldn't understand why the first Mad Max, a, a film which I, I thought was barely releasable, it was so hard to make. It was such a low budget. You thought barely releasable? Oh, yeah. it was. Uh, we made that film on a very, very small budget. I mean, if you look at the credits, there are only about barely 30 people on the credits. And Byron Kennedy and I did, did everything we... 
we delivered the screenplays on the back of my motorbike. We went, whenever we do a car crash in the back streets, we sweep up the broken glass. We would do everything like that. We, but I, I thought if you really planned a film meticulously, it was just a question of going out and executing it. I was very naive, but but that's what I thought you'd do. What happens is you get in and and make a movie, and there's always something conspiring against your best made plans, and you have to be able to make you know, micro, mid-course corrections and adapt to the circumstances as best as possible. I didn't understand that. And uh, we ran out of money in to, for post-production, so I spent the best part of a year editing it myself and confronted every day with all the things that I wish I had done or should have done or problems I couldn't solve. And that was a really, really uh, powerful experience because I was confronted with this sense of failure. When the film did go out from Australia around the world and was a big success in so many different cultures, I wasn't silly enough to think that that was uh, all my doing. So I, I, I asked, why, why is it working? And where, well, why do the Japanese see it as a samurai? Uh, Max is a kind of samurai. Why did the French critics talk, talk about it as being a Western on wheels and so on and so on? So that's when I started to read up about, uh, you know, saw the Joseph Campbell's Hero of the Thousand Faces and all his great study on, on comparative religion and folklore and so on, what is in common in all of storytelling, which is something that ha happens reflexly in all cultures across all, all space and time. There's always narrative. It's a way that we make the world coherent to ourselves and we share the world through stories. And that got into Mad Max uh, uh, 2, which was Road Warrior, and it was much more conscious. And Max was indeed a, a reluctant hero in that sense. He, he was some, someone who thought he could only survive by himself, really didn't put uh, much store in others. But you're right, in Mad Max 2, there's that feral child. And basically, Max then stepping away, as, as I guess the classic Western heroes did, and, and, and give over the future. But, you know, go to a movie like Babe. The moment I read the, the story, it was written by a farmer, Dick King Smith, who happened to write great children's stories, but he was, he was a, a pig farmer himself. And in this one story, he basically, even, I guess, without knowing it, had that classic structure of the hero myth. Babe is is a character, and it, it's stated explicit the beginning of the explicitly at the beginning of the movie. Babe changed his valley forever. It was classic hero myth. You you see it about as the future, and there's no question it's a, it's a, it's about the future. Same with Fury Road, but I see it as hero myth, which essentially does the same thing. But the reason I gave you I talked to you about Bruno Bettelheim when we met was that yeah. that that fairy tale thing, that idea of protecting children, the idea of the most primal fear is being visited in fairy tales. That's the reason I mentioned that to you, because those two movies, at that point you made only two, connected to me so deeply to Bettelheim. I think he had said something that I've observed through life over and over again. Now, with kids who want the same story over and over again, they are, in their own way, processing, processing something. If it's, I don't know, Hansel and Gretel, where you have, which is an incredibly dark story. I mean, uh, a weak father with a with a cold uh, stepmother who wants to get rid of the children, basically abandonment, and then uh, the children then get seduced by a gingerbread house and utterly, you know, totally indulge themselves, and then they have to become to survive. They have to kill the witch and so on and so on. They're pretty dark stuff. So kids, we, we want that story over and over again, processing something, and suddenly. We've seen, we've seen uh, they, they just stopped. They, they move on to the next story because something has happened. And you see that with movies. The parents tell me, uh, you know, if they watch Babe or Happy Feet, they watch them over and over until the parents can't. The kids insist that the parent of, often stays and watch, watches with them. And, and, and so many people have said, you know, I've watched Happy Feet like 70 times. And, and then suddenly it turns off, it's done its job, whatever that job is, and then moving on to the next thing. So I think, I think we still do that in a, in a way with stories, uh, even, even into, you know, 
all the way through our lives, and particularly with, with movies, we are definitely processing something. This, it, it, it's almost an unconscious thing. I'm, I'm sure we could sit and analyse it and so on, but quite often it's through stories. A little bit like dreams, really. I think movies are an extension of that. I mean, so many people have said, um, you know, it's public dreaming, really. We, we sit in the dark theatre with strangers and dream in public. It's a dream. We're talking about mythology, dreams, and movies with our old friend George Miller, whose newest film as director is the Oscar-nominated Mad Max Fury Road. I guess as you're talking about this, I think I've, I've read in any number of psychiatrists who said that movies have changed the way people dreamed. That they, there's been a notice that movies, that dreams have more of a narrative structure. I mean, you, if you read about Freud's essays on dreams and how sort of impressionistic they are versus dreams after the advent of movies as a public forum, and, and movies have changed the way people dream. They've, they've actually added a narrative to them. Really? So now there's, we've arrived at a time where I think, and your movies to me feel like they're very much a part of this, where there's a conversation between film language and dream language. Gosh, these, these are great conversations, Elvis. Every time, I, every time I come and talk to you, even if it's 40 years apart, we get, I get all this great stuff. And then, and then I go and read up about it and I say, yeah, it's yeah. I have a whole lot of time to think about this. Uh, but I guess I was wondering as we were talking about this, what were the, the first films you showed your kids? Um, basically, kids film. I mean, as my kids start to grow up, there was VHS and then DVDs and so on. So, you know, I, I took them to my favorite film as a kid and still one of my favorite films, Pinocchio. I thought there was a lot of stuff. Did it scare them? Um, I warned them enough uh, about it. You know, my daughter was around about the age of two and a half, three, grappling with the nature of, of death because one particular point she didn't want to go to my mother's birthday party because she saw birthday parties as people getting older and nearer to death and i didn't realize until i asked her why uh i didn't realize that that was going on and, and, she, and she was able to articulate it well enough so when we see a bambi or something like that and you sit and talk about it and and, and so on it's a great way of processing we did it also through through, through children's books that, that, that d deal with it. And then, you know, you get through all, all the classics and, and, and they love them, some they reject for whatever reason. And then pretty soon they're watching pretty sophisticated movies. I found them watching movies which had a lot of talking in them and they weren't just sort of action movies and, and, and um, you know, necessarily popular movies and really got a lot, a lot out of them. Stories should have a label, you know, um, hazardous material. Uh, not that we should in any way censor or manipulate our stories, but just be aware that they can have a big effect. And you never, you can never predict what that effect would be. You, you, the interesting thing about it, you make a movie. Uh, I've never written a novel or anything, but you know, I've made movies, and you cannot predict. Uh, what the response could be. It might be total indifference. And you think, oh, this is really important stuff here. And people just see the movie and say, yeah, that was okay, and completely forget it. And other things which you don't expect, people still talking. You, you bump into people and say, you know, I got so much of the, out, of, uh, out of that movie. And, uh, and they want to talk about it and, they, and, and so on. And it takes a while when you make a movie to even understand what you've wrought it. It takes a, quite a while for people, you read the reviews and people talk about it and maybe up to five or ten years later that, you know, when, when, you, when you look at it and, and you see somehow that there's been something there that has some degree of meaning to people. And all you can do as a storyteller is put your best effort forward and, and try to put a lot of subtext in, into the story. Even, even something like Fury Road, which could be just a chase film, uh, you know, I like to say we, 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 we try to put a lot of iceberg under the tip. So I don't know, it's a mystery. I've been doing it for a long time now, and, and it's still a very mysterious process to me. And we've been talking about it for a long time. We're out of time. I'm so sorry. You have to come back. Please come back and do the show again, George. It would be great to have you here. Yes, after all this time. Thanks so much, Elvis. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. My guest who makes movies that people are still talking about over 30 years later <laughs> is George Miller, whose newest film as director is Mad Max Fury Road. Our recording engineer here at NPR West is Patrick Murray. The show is mixed by Kat Yor. It's edited by Blake Bight, who's associate producer. I'm one of the living. It's the treatment.
catch up on past episodes with the treatment, go to KCRW.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. That don't